If you've got your Bibles, and you would turn with me to Luke chapter 15, we're down to verse 11, but we're going to, um, you know, the walk that Pat and I have walked, the one thing we have learned, we have learned that, that you have to give yourself time to transform your mind, and then that transformation, this is it. We stand on this, and we stand on no other. This will lead you down the path, the Word of God will lead you down the path, He will flip the switch of your dreamer again. And he will give you something to focus on. And when you find that focus, you stay on that focus. Good and well-meaning people will come, and good and well-meaning people will go. Scoffers will come, doubters will come, experienced people will come. Some of the most dangerous people you run into. Some of the most dangerous people you will run into are experienced people. Not that their experience is a bad thing, but if you begin to depend upon what is experience is status quo. Did you hear me? And and we're we're created to live above status quo. We're not created to live in the supernatural. To call those things that are not as though they were. I'm telling you, 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 what I'm getting ready to share with you, and, and here's the thing, until you experience it, until you experience what I'm going to talk to you about today, and it's going to be about God's love, until you experience it, it's going to be very difficult for you to, to, for God to flip the dreamer on and tell you it doesn't matter what your grandchild is doing, I have my hand on them. I don't care what your child is doing. I don't care where your child is at right now. I have my hand on them. See, see, God has a plan and purpose for your life, and it is above and not beneath. It is a God plan, and God has no small plans. Okay? You were created, and God led you into the kingdom to change your family tree. Whatever was will no longer be. Okay? He didn't call you in so that you would muddle along and suffer the, the anguish of family reunions and Christmases and Thanksgivings, believing what you believe and have to struggle through that every time you go someplace and, and you're, the, you're the oddball out. He called you to go in there and lead them out. And he'll do the work and they'll all look at you and, and give you the credit, but he'll do the work and you'll know who did it. You don't know who to give credit to. Okay? But you've got to have the vision. You cannot have it till you can see it. You can't have it till you can see it. And you can't and you can't have it until you say it. And you can't say it until you see it. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if it's not in your heart, if you can't visualize it, then you can't speak it. You even feel stupid thinking it. You feel almost ashamed to talk about it. I've learned to just prepare myself. When I stand in front of an architect, or if I stand in front of a banker, or if I stand in front of an attorney, or if I stand in front of an accountant, 
the people that I have to deal with, with the ministry and the vision that God's given me here, what I've had to learn to do is prepare myself before I ever go in there because I know what they're going to think. Pat said, she said, we're, we're going to start believing they catch the vision. <laughs> before it's over with, they're gonna, they're, their husbands and wives are going to say, you're crazy, you know. Amen. And you've got to see it because if you look at what your your what what those children are doing, I'm, I'm going to deal with children specifically today because there's nothing that hurts more than a wayward child, and there's no blame that gets heaped greater on your conscience than a wayward child. Amen? And, and here's the thing. You did everything that you do to do. Now you've got to see things differently than what you've been looking at. Today's the day it changes. Say it with me. Today, I change the way I look at my children. Today is the day that I change the way I look at my grandchildren. So you don't have grandchildren yet, but you better start speaking it before they get here. Amen. I know the enemy cannot have my children because I spoke over my children while they were in their mother's womb. We poured the word of God in them from the very beginning. Can I tell you, there's a battle for that. There's a battle for getting up here proclaiming the truth. I strike a line in the, on the battlefield every Sunday morning. I strike a line. See, this is not just fun time Facebook posts. Look at what I know. Got a lot of that. Look at what I know. See what I know? You've got to understand every time you will share what you know. You just struck a line in the battlefield. And we're not overcoming. Now we've got to learn how to overcome. Amen? Because once you're an overcomer in you, come on, then, then taking hold will not be a problem. You won't get this, this, you, see, you've got to focus to get a hold of it. Because God's got a big plan for you. So now watch this. And I want you to understand, before we get into the verse, the first verse we're going to go into, we're going to back up just a little bit to verse 1 and 2, because this is very important. Then drew near into him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Did you hear that? Who's trying to listen to Jesus? The politicians and the sinners. That's who's trying to hear Jesus. They're the only ones that recognize hope in his voice. The rest of them are critiquing whether he's speaking the truth or not. They hear with their heart and understand with their mind that he's speaking the truth because he's bringing hope. What was it that was prophesied to this nation before he got there eons before, thousands of years before, that, it, that, that, that hope was coming? Sin has come into the world, but hope is coming. So when Jesus showed up, you had two sects of, 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 of people. You had people that were critiquing what he was saying and casting blame and trying to find blame. And then you had the politicians and the sinners. And the politicians and the sinners were trying to hear what he had to say. See, you don't have to try to convince a politician and a sinner. Isn't it funny they put those two together? God put those two together? I think that's pretty interesting, you know. All politicians need to be very, very uh, humbled by that. God categorizes you with the sinners. Amen. So... Why? Because you're very apt to operate on your own. That's the problem. What power and what influence I have, I can get this job done. And we, 
you know, we let, we're not letting God. Amen? So, okay, we'll get away from that because I'll be in trouble. Um, it, it, but here we go. That's who's trying to hear him. Amen? So, when we go to this scripture, I have found myself, when I'm trying to, trying to um, minister to somebody, I find it so much easier to minister to someone who's not had a lot of church in them. Because they're not trying to prove whether I'm what I'm telling. I'm trying to convince. I have to convince them first before we can ever go on any. any other. And you know what? I spend all my wheels and efforts to trying to convince them. And then what they do is they leave and they go back to the crowd that they're with. And and what happens is everything I tried to do to convince them just got washed away with their own belief system. And that belief system is. Oh boy, I tell you, let me ask you a question. And and, and I just I just. I, I'm not going to preach about it. I'm not going to hammer you. Matter of fact, I, 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 I've got to make sure who I'm preaching to so I can adjust the message so you, I can articulate where you can understand it. How many of you are Southern Baptists? You used to be Southern Baptists. I knew I had a bunch. You know how I knew? I got a hold of something this last week from Southern Baptist Convention. I've been studying them lately. You know? And I said, Wow. Uh, okay, I, he's, yeah, I'm, I'm just, you know, wow. And he goes, yeah, he said, that's what you're preaching to. I said, oh, can't be. He says, oh, yeah, that's what you're ministering to. He says, you need to ask Sunday morning how many Southern Baptists. I said, okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, I'm praying now for you. I'm telling you, I'm praying now. Praise God. All right, so then the Pharisees and scribes, murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. <sighs> a Savior came, and he is hanging out with people who need saved. I can't believe it. Can you believe this? The audacity for a Savior to come and go hang out with sinners to deliver them. He should be over here with us. We know all this stuff. We know more than he does. We can tell him a few things. The writer of it all, you know, we can tell him a few things. Help that author out with what he said. All right, now that we've got a depiction of what's going on, Jesus just ignores them. If we get anything today, we got to get that Jesus just ignored them. He didn't respond to them. He didn't turn around and give them any attention. He didn't try to explain or confirm himself or try to reestablish himself or try to help them understand what he was here to do. He ignored them. When you see what your daughter is doing, when you see what your son is doing, when you know where they should be and what they're doing is what where they should be, when you see that grandchild doing things they shouldn't be doing, you've got to ignore what they're doing. Can you do anything about what they're doing? Can you stop them from doing? You want to stop them from doing, but you can't stop them from doing. You can't stop them making the choices they're making. You can't stop them hanging around who they're hanging around with. You can't stop the influences. You can't stop the voices. You can't, and you've been trying to stop that. You've been trying to sit down and come now let us reason together. And let's try to get you to, you know, look at things. And they will never, because they leave your presence and they go right back into that influence. And they're, they, they're confirmed in that influence even stronger than what they were before they talked to you. So what do I do? We realign our focus. Watch it. I love this story. One of my favorite stories in the Bible. And he said, he just ignored them. And just went right on. He went up preaching is what he did. And he, says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided them his living. Now I want you to understand, when he said that, in essence, in English today, if we were to understand what he was saying, he would have said, 
I can't wait for you to die. Uh, this is your own son. You have servants. How many of you have got servants? None of you have arrived yet? You don't have servants? I don't, I don't have servants either. I have to do the work myself. Does Rick have a servant? You! <laughs>
And he went and joined himself, joined himself to a citizen of that country. There's your issue. That influence that's in their life. That influence that's dragging them further away. What's amazing is you need to realize and picture this thing as if we see the influence come and we focus on the influence and then our imagination takes off with us and we begin to imagine all the horrible things that can happen with this influence. Can I tell you, nobody will provide for your children like you will, and nobody will take care of your children like God will. Nobody. Watch what this influence did for this boy. He joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the field, the, the guy he joined him with, sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have faint, have, and he would have fame have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat. See who he's filled? He's, he's connected with somebody that's not taking care of him. Will not take care of him. Thinks of him no more. He, he feeds the swine, but he won't feed that boy. <coughs> and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, everybody say this, when they come to themselves. Until then, say it with me, until then, I can do nothing. They have to come to themselves. Who brings them to themselves? The one who promised you that you and your household will be saved. That's the one that brings them to themselves. And he has a way to bring them to themselves. He's got a way to wake them up on the side. And get them, they get on the side of their bed and they begin to think about the way they've raised. About home. About how it wasn't so bad. About the things that dad warned me about. And now here I am. How did I get here? About the things mom spoke to me about. How did I get here? Hello? See, you try to talk to them about that. And you and what you're trying to do, when you try to talk to them about that, what I found in my own life, when I was trying to when I try to talk to them about it, it's because I'm focusing on the uh, altered influence. I'm trying to curb that influence. With my influence. You see? And now we've got a battle of influence. And how many of you know your kids pretty much quit listening to you about 18? Before. Maybe before. Before. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so much influence out there in the world. They'll look at you and smile, and they'll, they'll treat you like they're still listening to you. All right? Watch. And he said to himself, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will rise, I will go to my father, and I will say unto him, now listen to this. If you don't get this for yourself, you will never be able to give this. If you don't get this for yourself, you cannot give what you do not have. And the greatest expression of ownership is the ability to give it away. To transfer it to someone else. Okay? He said, I, I will go to my father and I'll say to him, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Take me as one of thy hired servants. Now, I want us to just combine that just to a short phrase. I have sinned. I am not worthy. I am a servant. Now, say it with me. I have sinned. I'm not worthy. 
I'm just a servant. Isn't that just what religion has taught you? I'm just a sinner saved by grace. I'm not worthy. I'm just a servant. Wow. Aren't you glad you got out of that influence? But you know what? You could never be transferred, because it was hard for you just to say that with me, wasn't it? I mean, it's like, I, 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 I'm a what? I'm, I'm not worthy? I already know I am, you know? But see, what happens is, is, is this going back and forth. You never get transferred. You never get transferred. You never get transformed. You stay in the middle vacillating between two mutually exclusive opinions. There's no, at this point, you have gone too far. Because for me now to try to convince you that you're not worthy, you would quit coming here. If I tried to convince you now that you're a sinner saved by grace, you would quit coming here. If I tried to convince you now that you're just a servant, you would quit coming here. Right? Why? Because now you know. I know who I am. You found a place that now, you see, vacillating back and forth. Those who hear the truth and they go back to that garbage are, are not like Abraham. They're not like Abraham. Abraham had great faith because he did not waver. The word waver in that passage means to vacillate on a slick surface back and forth between two mutually exclusive opinions. And the Bible says Abraham had great faith. Why? Because he never vacillated between two mutual. He found the opinion of God and he decided I'll stick with it and I will stick with no other. Whoa. See, you can't slide back to that church that's going to tell you or has any words in there of fellowship that says you're just a servant. I'm telling you, you can't because until you get solid in the faith of Abraham, the faith of God, until you get solid in it, you can't, the, the, the dreamer in you cannot be flipped so you can see your children delivered before they're delivered.
And we say, well, he might. Be Why do we say because he might? Because we've watched the experience of the group of influences we've been around, and all we can derive from the percentage points is that he might. Well, it's time for you to start hanging around some other people that have, have a greater testimony than he might, but that he will. Amen? And begin to develop in you the stall worthiness to walk out the door, go to the edge of the property, and all you can see is them coming home. Because when they come home, they're coming home with, I'm not worthy. I failed you. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, I just don't, I'm not, I'm not that son I once was, or I'm not that daughter I was. I'll never be able to be that. You don't know the filthy things I've done. You don't know the filthy people I've been around. You don't know the terrible things that I've been to experience. You have no idea. I could, I'm so ashamed of myself. And I'll never be the daughter that I was whenever I left you. I'll never be the son that I was when I left you. See, that's what they're dealing with. And they want to come home, and they want to try to share that with you so they make sure they put themselves in that position so that they that you understand, I'm really not really what I once was. And you know what you've got to be able to do? Not work it up. Not go, go back and find you a CD, listen to it so you can, you know, stir it up. You've got to have it in you that you stop them in the middle of their conversation. What did the father do? He didn't let him get that out. He said he stopped him in his tracks, grabbed him and hugged him, turned around to the servant and said, go get the robe, go get the ring, go get the shoes, go kill a calf. We're going to have a party for this day. My son has come home. It was a celebration. He celebrated his child. God celebrates you. How do you get to the day of the celebration? You've got to see things differently than you see them now. You have to quit looking at what they're doing, and you have to look at who they are. In Christ Jesus, the promise that God gave you. Amen. I see them tongue-talking. I see them prophesying. I see them preaching. I see them speaking. I see them building the kingdom of God. I see them orchestrating and, 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 and dreaming the kingdom of God. I see them winning their, their neighborhood. People following them for their influence. I see them. Do you see them? So I have trouble seeing myself do that stuff, Pastor. See what I'm saying? If you can't see yourself, how will you ever see them? You've got to see yourself. I've heard people say, I struggle. Like, I, I, I just can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you see yourself receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Do you see yourself speaking in tongues? Do you see yourself interpreting? Do you see yourself having the gift of... of, 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 uh, of, of uh, uh, healing, the gift, the gift of faith, the gift, do you see yourself? See, you have a gift, you can give it away. Do you see yourself? Do you see yourself giving that away? Do you see yourself? See, I started seeing myself. Whenever I wanted to speak in tongues, I, started, I knew God called me. I ran, I ran, I ran, I ran, I ran, I ran. And I, I began to see myself laying hands on people that were receiving the Holy Spirit. And I wasn't speaking in tongues. But I knew that was me. I, I had to have that. And I was raised in it. I should have been See myself. See myself laying hands on people and they, they, they receive the gift of faith. Amen? I, I'm transferring something that I don't even have yet, but I believe that I will. Amen? Do you believe you will? I'm telling you, you've got to get, you've got to get in a position where God can flip the switch again. And the dream begins to, the dream of who you are. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It all starts with his love. And I'm going to just give you a little close right here with a really short story. It all starts with his love. For God so loved the world 
that he gave. What's the inspiration of his giving? Why will he give anything to you? Because he loves you. No other reason. For God so loved the world that he gave. No other reason. Not because you're good or you're not good. Not because you thought a bad thought or you thought a good thought. Not because you did a good thing or did a bad thing. God will do for you, not because his word says so. His word says so because, so you've got to go to the, 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 the foundation of this. He's not going to heal you because his word says so. He's going to heal you because he loved you and then he said so. Oh. See, you're worthy. You're worthy because he said so. I'm walking outside of Casey's. The current coffee, coffee pot, it shut down that day. <laughs> That's a bad day. I don't have my creamer. I don't have my stuff. But I got to have a cup of coffee. So I go in and I doctor up me a cup of coffee. And I go to the register and I buy the coffee and I walk out the door and as I'm stepping off the, the concrete step, God says, how much does that coffee cost? And just like our old sinner saved by grace attitude, we get to feeling, well, did I spend too much for the coffee? But if, if, why are you asking me about the coffee? I mean, first thing, you get condemnation. Come on. We're all, we're all right there on the edge of it all the time. Our enemy makes sure of that. We just have to take those thoughts captive. That's why he said take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. And I said, what, what, what's, what's, what, what's the deal with the price of coffee? He said, what did you pay for it? I said, I don't know. Why are you interested? I said it. I said, Father, why are you interested? You know, I didn't know you cared about coffee. He said, well, I don't care about coffee. I'm just wanting to know how much you paid for it. And I said, I, I don't know. I Four or five dollars? Hmm. I said, is that a, I'm back to the truck, and I, is that a problem? Is that, should I not spend that four or five dollars for the coffee? He says, no. He says, you exchanged for your coffee. You exchanged what you had for your coffee, and you didn't think a thing about it. You can't even tell me how much it cost. I said, no, sir, I sure can't. He said, I so love you that I laid down my life for you. And I didn't consider it one minute. I didn't consider my life one moment to lay myself down just to have you. Now he's got my attention, you know. Huh. He said, it didn't matter how much it cost. As no, I had no, no consideration for what the price would be. Because that's the value that he has for you. Now that was his sovereign decision, and it was his sovereign decision economics that chose that. He chose the price that it would cost. You didn't. And he laid it down and paid for it. Now, I would only buy that coffee because I wanted it. Wouldn't you? Why did he buy you? Did somebody hold a gun to his head? Was his people maker broke down so he had to buy you? No. He bought you because he wanted you. That makes you worthy. I'm worthy. Say it with me. I'm worthy. I'm worthy. I'm worthy. I'm worthy. He loves me and I don't even know why he loves me and I'm going to quit trying to figure out why. 
He loves me because he chose to love me. And in that love, he wrote down, out of that love, he wrote down in scripture so that I could read that me and my household will be saved. Now he'll save them because he loves me. He will turn them around because he loves me. He will take them to the end of their road and give them no other place to go but back to me because he loves me. He loves me so much, he will, he will deal with them and he will save them and he will put their word in them and, and, and he will put their, his love in them and he, by that love they will come back to me. Now, if you believe that, why would you worry another day about them? Why would you lose another night's sleep over it? See, what you've got to do is every time you think about them, that starts, that cycle starts, you just got to say, hey, Father, you love me. I'm worthy. You made me worthy. And out of that love, you wrote your word that you would save this child. And I'm not going to worry about this child. You stay with me that late at night worry about this child. I'm going to go to bed and I'm going to sleep. I know you've got them because you love me. And because you love me, you love them. And because you love them, you will not let them slide out. They won't. They've not left your hand yet. Might look like it, but they haven't. you got to quit looking at what it looks like. You know what we learned? I told a lady the other day. She, I asked her about her son, and she, she dropped her head. As soon as she dropped her head, it broke my heart, because I know what that feels like. And she said, well, I said, is he working on his testimony? And she looked up and she says, yeah. I said, he's going to have a heck of a testimony, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's going to have one heck of a testimony when he's done. I said, I have to say no more. She said, I got it. He's working on his testimony. See, now we're starting to see it differently. Starting to see it differently. Where are they at right now? It doesn't matter. They're working on their testimony. <laughs> Hallelujah. And one day they'll tell the world. Amen. All right. You got it? You got it? You're worthy. He loves you. And because he loves you, he wrote in that word. Because he loved you, he inspired that word. And now you can take those words to the bank. You can speak those words because they're words written out of a heart of love to you. Amen? All right. God bless you. Won't you stand? Won't you love on one another? Tell them you're glad they come to church today. Tell them glad to see them today at High Point. We love you. We appreciate you. God be with you all week. Amen.